Hello everyone, I'm Billy and thanks for joining me today. Welcome to episode 6 of the Ropeway Center Report, where we will talk about ropeway safety. We'll look into what makes ropeways one of the safest modes of transit in the world. Let's get started. Here is an overview of what we are going to be talking about today. First, I'll go over some statistics about ropeway safety to show exactly how safe riding a ropeway is. We'll look into standards and governmental oversight that ensure all ropeways meet certain desired criteria before they can be operated for the public. We'll also touch on some of the mechanical and electrical safety equipment that is built into ropeways to prevent accidents from occurring. Lastly, we'll look at some historical ropeway accidents to discuss what happened, why it happened, and what changed in the industry as a result. Overall, the goal of this webinar is to show just how committed the industry is to safety at every step. The National Ski Areas Association has compiled a comprehensive collection of data about ropeway safety in the United States. From 1973 to 2020, they estimate there were 18.3 billion lift rides in the United States. This adds up to 9.2 billion miles of lift rides, which is the equivalent of traveling from the Earth to the Sun just under 100 times. Through all these ropeway rides, there were 30 total fatalities. However, this includes circumstances such as health incidents and maintenance accidents that occur outside of the normal operating parameters of lifts. There have only been 14 deaths in the United States due to mechanical issues with operating ropeways during normal operation, most of which occurred in the 1970s and 1980s in several high-profile incidents that we will discuss later. This results in an incredibly high degree of safety for ropeways, which averaged 0.142 fatalities per 100 million miles compared to 1.13 for automobiles. Falls from chairlifts are also a common myth about ropeway safety. Data from the CPTSB in Colorado, collected over an 11-year period, states that 86% of falls are due to passenger behavior, with 4% being due to medical issues and only 2% due to mechanical or operator error. The rest were undetermined. Numbers don't lie, and these numbers say ropeways are an incredibly safe form of transit. Why is that the case? A big reason is the ANSI B77 standards or the American National Standard for Passenger Ropeways, which includes aerial tramways, aerial lifts, surface lifts, tows and conveyors, and a separate one for funiculars. It is a compilation of guidelines and re regulations that every operating ropeway in the United States must follow to be built and open. These codes are updated every five years by a diverse panel known as the ANSI B77 Standards Committee. Members of the committee fall into one of these categories, allied industry, employee, government, independent specialist, insurance, manufacturer, or operator. Together, they input their knowledge and experience to update the standards with new information and make sure user safety is paramount. There are, se there are several subsections to the standards. Both design and installation and electrical design and installation apply to new lifts being constructed, while operation and maintenance apply to all lifts being operated. This allows the standards to change so existing systems can be grandfathered in while still adhering to safe standards for operating. Note here that Europe has the CEN standards for ropeways and Canada has the Z98 standards, which both function in similar ways. Let's take a closer look at some ANSI B77 standards. The Information Center for Ropeway Studies keeps a collection of previous editions of the ANSI B77 standards available for historic reference, so any engineers or industry personnel can come in and look and see how the standards have changed over time. Here's a copy that we have of the B77 standards for passenger ropeways. Uh, from 2006, so I'm going to read a section here, and again, these are uh, not the most updated version. These is just an example one that I pulled from 2006. Um, so stuff may have been updated from this over time uh, by design, which is part of ANSI, um, part of how these standards work. So I'll read from section four, fixed grip aerial lifts, uh, 4.1, design and installation, and I'll take a look at table 4.1. 4-1, which is maximum relative carrier speed in feet per minute for chairlifts with fixed grips. So for skiers, for a single chair it's 600 feet per minute, a double chair is 550, a triple chair is 500, and other chairs, so quads and larger, are 450. For foot passengers, a single chair is 350 feet per minute, a double chair is 300, a triple chair is 275, and other chairs are 250. So this also will contain all sorts of stuff for how the chairlift will be built, uh, line clearances, vertical clearances, uh, width of clearing, location, all sorts of different stuff uh, that will stipulate, if you're building a fixed grip chairlift, what needs to be incorporated into the design. A lot has changed since the very first edition of standards we have, which is from 1960. So you can see this is the thickness of the standards in 1960 for aerial passenger tramways. 
And this is the thickness of them just 46 years later. So you can see this is how much the industry is continually learning and refining their knowledge about the safety and just continually improving, making ropeways safer and safer every year, every iteration. Uh, I also wanted to bring up, we have some copies of the Z98 Canadian standards. These are the standards for passenger ropeways and passenger conveyors. In addition to the ANSI standards, there are 21 U.S. states that have their own governmental program to oversee ropeways and enforce the B77 standards as well as their own rules and regulations. For example, Colorado has the Colorado Passenger Tramway Safety Board, or CPTSB for short. These governmental oversight groups will also permit and license ropeways, oversee the construction of new systems, including acceptance testing, and investigate any incidents. The National Ropeway Safety Team of the U.S. Forest Service performs similar work for lifts on federal land. Insurance companies and the lift manufacturers themselves can also perform inspections and provide guidance to ensure ropeways are operating safely. There are a lot of involved parties to check that an operating ropeway is safe for the public. Engineers incorporate numerous designs into ropeway systems to ensure maximum safety. I covered these components in more detail in Episode 4 of the Ropeway Center Report on Ropeway Components, but I wanted to bring up some of those components once again for reference. The top left image shows tire banks on a detachable ropeway. Here we can see some of the terminal safety devices that will automatically stop the lift if abnormal situations are detected. This includes grip force, grip profile, and cable position. Proximity switches also monitor the path of the grip through the terminal and will trigger a stop if abnormal travel of the grips through the terminal occurs, like zone faults and counter faults. The top middle image shows a shift train with a view of the cable position sensors. On systems that run over a certain speed, code requires two redundant systems to monitor the haul rope on the towers. In this picture, we can see the proximity sensor, which is tripped when the haul rope gets too far from the switch, and a brittle bar, which is broken if the haul rope slips out of the shivs and into the cable catchers. Both of these are sometimes referred to as loops, since there are loops of current running between the towers of the lifts for both systems that will be broken if there is a tower fault, thus triggering a stop. The image on the top right shows the emergency and rollback brakes located directly on the bull wheel of a detachable lift. For normal operation, such as a fallen skier, a normal stop is used, which has a caliper on the flywheel or high-speed disc at the drive. In an emergency situation, an emergency stop will be triggered either by the operator or automatically by the lift controls. This acts directly on the bull wheel for a quicker, more direct stop. The rollback braking system has no operator inputs. Various types of systems exist to check if a rollback is occurring, such as AB pulses or rollback pucks on the bull wheel. Either way, they all send a message to the controls to stop the lift during a rollback event and activate the rollback brake on the bull wheel flange. Drive strain backstops are also used to prevent a rollback. Lastly, the image on the bottom right shows a schematic of some various types of auxiliary drive setups for ropeways. These can power the system if there is a problem with the primary mover, such as electric motor failure or a power outage. There's always at least one diesel auxiliary engine, and some lifts also have tertiary drives that can power the lift directly on the bull wheel in the event of gearbox failure. The bottom line is that ropeway engineers have taken every available step to monitor the ropeway's operation and provide redundancy for components where possible. Ropeway maintenance personnel play a critical role in ropeway safety. They are there to inspect components and replace or rebuild them when necessary. A big part of this is preventative maintenance, where ropeway mechanics will check and replace ropeway components according to a set schedule before there are any problems. This includes grip rebuilding, where a certain percentage of ropeway grips as mandated by either the codes or the manufacturer, whichever is stricter, are inspected each year or after a certain number of operating hours. The grips are taken apart and checked through non-destructive testing, or NDT. This often includes magnetic particle testing, where a part is magnetized and sprayed with a liquid revealer or colored iron dust. Any cracks are exposed since the medical metal particles will be attracted to it. This is used for major components like grip jaws. Any bad parts will be replaced with new ones and the grip is reassembled and placed back online replacing any fasteners as necessary in the process. NDT can identify cracks not visible to the naked eye, such as micro fatigue cracks or weld cracks, catching them long before they become an issue. Many ropeway components, in addition to grips, such as chair welds and important tower gussets, can also be subject to NDT. Speaking of towers, a major component of preventative ropeway maintenance is line work. Ropeway maintenance personnel travel to a tower on a work carrier, lift the haul rope off the shivs, spin all the shivs to check bushings, and check for wear on the rubber shiv liners. Shivs are replaced with rebuilt ones as necessary. Maintenance personnel work year-round to keep ropeways in top shape with these tasks and more. The top left image shows a set of rebuilt grips 
The bottom left image shows an insert clip grip with a crack revealed by magnetic particle testing. The bottom middle image shows a grip being rebuilt on a stand, and the right image shows a work carrier and rigging during line work on a hold down shiv assembly. There are also extensive safety considerations during the daily operation of a ropeway. Maintenance personnel have daily, weekly, monthly, biannual, and annual inspections for various different components, such as a weekly run of the auxiliary diesel power unit. Operation staff check certain functions of the ropeway daily before it can open to the public. These are split up into static stops, which are performed while the lift is stopped to just confirm the indication, as well as moving stops, which take place while the lift is running. Operations and maintenance personnel are trained to understand all the functions of the ropeway they are working at and any emergency procedures according to ANSI B77 and state regulations. They can be tested on this during inspections, either announced or unannounced random inspections. As we shift gears a little to ropeway accidents, I want to recap what we've said so far. First, ropeway accidents are exceedingly rare, largely due to the industry's intense focus on safety. A large number of safety features, procedures, regulations, and training practices exist to ensure that passenger safety is paramount. Remember, there have only been 14 total fatalities caused by ropeway malfunctions in North America since 1973, most during the 1970s and 1980s. However, discussing these accidents is important for transparency purposes and to show major leaps in ropeway safety technology. When an accident does occur, the industry takes comprehensive efforts to understand the situation and prevent it from happening in the future. We will go over some high profile ropeway accidents and answer three critical questions. What happened? Why did it happen? And what changed to make the industry safer? The first accident we will discuss occurred on March 26, 1976 on Gondola 2 at Lion's Head in Vail, Colorado a bi-cable gondola built by Bell Engineering. The carriage wheels of a cabin derailed from the track cable and became tangled when it reached the tower saddle. The hull rope continued to move against the stuck cabin, sawing through the grip jaws until they failed and the cabin fell to the ground. This happened to a second cabin. However, it did not fall and instead slid back down the cable into another car and caused it to fall to the ground. It slid into another cabin before the ropeway was stopped. Two cabins were on the ground and two were knocked into each other on the line. Four people died from this accident and there were eight additional injuries. A detailed investigation determined that design flaws with the placement of the towers and carriage wheel loads put stress on the track cable and caused one of the locked coil outer wires to fail, which unraveled and derailed one of the traveling carriages. This resulted in a comprehensive redesign of this lift and other bi-cable gondolas, which were fairly common at the time, to different profiles and an increased number of carriage wheels. The amount of safety monitoring equipment on the lines was increased so operators would know sooner if there was a similar problem on the line to stop the ropeway. Lastly, this established a streamlined process for how ropeway accidents would be investigated and handled by regulatory agencies to provide a clear, unanimous conclusion and results. The next accident we will discuss is the Squaw Valley Aerial Tram Accident. This is a 120 passenger aerial tram built by Garaventa in 1968. On April 15, 1978, the track cables suddenly and rapidly came free of their saddle grooves on Tower 2. The inside track rope lodged in the haul rope shivs, while the other came off the tower and plunged rapidly below. It cut into the cabin, causing four deaths and 26 injuries. Later analysis determined that an unusual and unpredictable combination of forces caused the incident. There was a sudden extreme wind gust that combined with the weight of the approaching cabin to create a critical fleet angle and thus a creep that resulted in the track ropes rapidly leaving the saddle. In response, the industry enacted stricter wind and atmospheric monitoring requirements. Aerial tramways are also now subject to stricter wind operation limits, such as slowing the system down during any high wind events. Yawn lifts is an important topic when discussing the history of ropeway safety. Yawn, also known as Lift Engineering, was a company started by Jan Kuczynski, which built their first lifts in 1968. They built mostly fixed grip lifts and were known for building lifts that were innovative, simple, and durable until several high profile incidents in the 80s and 90s. The two discussed here occurred on the Teller Lift and the Quicksilver Lift. The Teller Lift was a fixed grip triple chair built in 1984 at Keystone, Colorado. On December 14, 1985, the top bow wheel suddenly fell off the drive structure. The resulting whip like action in the line caused 60 passengers to fall from the chairs, of which 49 were injured and two were killed. Engineers and investigators determined that the welded hub of the bull wheel failed, disconnecting it from the gearbox shaft and causing it to fall. A bad weld and poor quality control were determined to be the main causes. 
leading to enhanced inspection and quality control efforts of new installations nationwide. The Quicksilver Lift was a Yon detachable bubble quad chair built in 1991 at Whistler Mountain, Canada. After an emergency stop on the lift on December 23, 1995, bouncing motion on a steep section of the line caused a grip to slide down the hall rope. It slid down to the chair behind it and fell to the ground. The second chair also slid down the hall rope, collecting two more chairs in the process before they reached a tower and all three fell to the ground. Ten people were injured and two were killed. A detailed engineering analysis and inspection from the coroner revealed many faults with the Yon detachable equipment. The grips did not have the proper lateral swing clearance, causing them to contact towers and become damaged over time. Tower shifts, I should say. The rubber springs used on the grips were also subject to material and temperature variations, much more so than steel coil springs or cup washers used on other types of grips. This combined to make the grips highly dependent on gravity and subject to reduced gripping forces due to vertical forces, such as a steep line or a bouncing profile due to rope dynamics. The aftermath resulted in major modifications to all Yon detachable lifts, including all new grips and sometimes new line gear. There were also stricter enforcements of codes and maintenance requirements for grips, since the safety checks that would have alerted personnel to the incident had either been mal malfunctioning or disabled. The later Yan model lifts, Yan model lifts, which struggled with quality control issues, were either outright replaced or retrofitted with new equipment. Lift engineering went out of business in 1996. I would like to reiterate that the existing Yan lifts are exceptionally safe and reliable. Nobody should have any concern when boarding a Yan lift today. Any Yan lift with potential quality control issues was removed or thoroughly modified. The focus here was on North American ropeway accidents, but I also wanted to bring up some of the higher profile international incidents as well. The most deadly aerial ropeway accident occurred on an aerial tram in 1976 in Cavalese, Italy. The track and hull rope crossed each other due to a high wind event. The hull rope severed the track rope and the tram cabin fell to the ground. 43 people were killed. Poor maintenance of the system had led to faulty safety system that would have monitored for this situation. There were adjustments to maintenance protocols and safety system setups, as well as criminal charges for those responsible for the oversight. In a cruel circumstance, Cavalese was also the site of the 1998 incident where a NATO aircraft severed the track rope on an aerial tram and sent the cabin to the ground, causing 20 deaths. The ropeway was functioning normally, but the aircraft was flying too close to the ground. Minimum height areas around ropeways have been subject to a stricter enforcement after this, and future ropeways with long or very high spans have been built with a heightened focus to prevent any aircraft incidents. Lastly is the 2001 incident on the Caprun funicular in Austria. A fire outbreak in a funicular cabin grew out of control in the narrow underground tunnel that the ropeway traveled through. 155 people lost their lives. The fire was caused by a cabin heating unit being used in an incorrect application and catching fire, which then set fire to the hydraulic system on board. It was previously believed that a funicular fire was impossible since there were only low voltage controls on board and few sources for fuel. This tragedy resulted in heightened fire precautions for funicular systems, such as smoke detectors and SOS buttons. There's also now strict requirements to ensure that any equipment from third party vendors, no matter how small, is 100% safe to use in a ropeway. I wanted to give some concluding thoughts here on why it is important to talk about ropeway accidents. Like I've said before, the numbers support ropeways being one of the world's safest modes of transport. Any ropeway accident is thoroughly investigated to find the cause and determine the course of action to make sure ropeways are safer than ever moving forward. The accidents I have discussed today are all high profile and well known. I wanted to use them as an example to show how seriously the industry takes safety by showing how all of these led to meaningful, lasting change in the industry to make it safer. Whether that was a new understanding of unique conditions that could be dangerous or new or stricter rules and codes. These are the sources I used to put together today's webinar episode. The sources were either found online or accessed through the Information Center for Ropeway Studies database. The images are either my own personal images, images from the Ropeway Center, or open source images of lifts available online. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I am proud to be associated with an industry that has safety as the absolute number one priority. From engineers to lift mechanics and operators, every step in the design, construction, and operation of a ropeway is done with safety at the forefront. Our next episode will be our first episode of Special Topics, the Ropeway Center Report Road Trip. 
I will get out of the library and show you some cool ropeways out in the real world, including historic ropeways and modern ropeways. I am really looking forward to that, so I hope you'll join me. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll catch you on the next episode of the Ropeway Center Report. Bye!